morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this session. We're going to talk about chat ops, bots, and how to do all that with PowerShell. Just a quick show of hands. How many people know what chat ops already is? And how many of you already have bots that you're using? All right. So first, uh, I'm Steve Lee. I'm the engineering manager for the PowerShell team. In this session, we're going to talk about uh, how you can leverage chat ops and bots. And the key thing here is you're going to be able to do all this with just PowerShell skills. There's some other skills you may have to learn in terms of like cloud, REST, JSON, but it's mostly just leveraging your PowerShell skills. From the agenda perspective, um, since not everyone here knows what chat ops and bots is, uh, we're going to cover some of that in detail. I'm going to also talk about serverless. So we're going to build on top of a serverless platform. Uh, I'm going to talk and show you actually from scratch how to build a very simple bot that works with Teams and also with Azure, using uh, Azure Functions. And I, hopefully for the, the most of the, the session, I'm actually going to step through some code on a bot that I built that the PowerShell team uses on a daily basis on our GitHub repo, which integrates between GitHub and Azure DevOps. And we'll have time at the end for uh, Q&A. So first, uh, what exactly is chat ops? So here's a kind of simple example. It's got Sad Joey on a phone. So imagine he's like at a Starbucks or something like that. And what's it showing, uh, if you can't read it from the back, basically the bot is telling Joey, hey, your last PR has some failures. And now Joey is able to actually respond to the bot using just regular chat and say, hey, give me, tell me what those failures are. And then the bot would come back and say, here's what, you, what it is, and then he can decide what to do next. So the key thing here is, first, uh, chat ops is a term that's defined, I think it originated from GitHub. And the idea here is really have conversation-driven operations. So instead of just having like you at a terminal and just running scripts, executing automation, it's really having this two-way exchange. So it's more of an interactive process. Uh, and the key thing here really about using chat versus just like a normal terminal window is really if you're on a team of other engineers or other DevOps engineers, it's really providing that visibility so when something fails, everyone can see what happens. They can see what steps you've taken with the bot to see how to fix it. So it becomes like a historical record, right? So instead of having these little yellow, yellow stickies all over the place that says when this problem happens, you do this, people can actually search through history. People who are not there during that day, they're out sick, they can still look and see what uh, engineers had done to fix it. So then what exactly is a bot? So a bot really is just an application that receives requests, uh, handles those requests for you, and returns results. So it's, it's actually not that complicated. Now traditionally, before serverless really kind of became uh, viable, you had different bot frameworks that you had to kind of code to. So here's just two uh, simple examples. One, the first one's from um, Azure, the second one's from GitHub. And the idea here is that if you wanted to build a classic bot, this would be like a microservice, which means that it runs all the time in the cloud, uh, waiting for res uh, res requests, handling responses. Uh, and it means that you have to code to a specific set of APIs. So instead of doing that, we're going to talk about serverless. So the key thing here really is, you know, given the name, there's no server. So server here means there's no container, there's no VM, uh, you're not managing any type of server. Another key aspect of serverless is that you really only pay for what you use. So if you have a VM or a container, as long as that's up and running, even if it's not handling requests, you're paying for that CPU time. And the key uh, other aspect is whether, again, whether you're using AWS or Azure, you have uh, scaling is built as part of serverless. So if the load comes in that's much more heavy, then basically the serverless platform is going to spin up more instances of your application to handle this load. So then why not just use serverless for everything? And really, the short version is it's very complicated, or it can be more complicated. So the first thing I think about is, and I'm going to talk more in terms of Azure Function, which is um, what I'm more accustomed to. Uh, when you're writing your function, it has to be ephemeral, which means it has to be short-lived. So one of the key aspects of a serverless platform, and the reason why the costs are low, is that you're kind of sharing time with other uh, tenants. In this case, your function has anywhere between 5 minutes to 15 minutes of lifetime. Afterwards, it's going to be killed and recycled and freed up for someone else. All right. So you got to think that when you're designing your script, they have to be short-lived. So you can't have a classic procedural script that takes like 15 minutes to uh, create some VMs, you know, and do some provisioning. That's just or 20 minutes. That's not necessarily going to work in this uh, model. You got to think in terms of item potency. So if you're familiar with DSC, this is not a new concept. The, the basic thing is again, because your functions can get killed because they're short-lived, you need to be able to rerun those same functions and not have any si uh, adverse side effects. So it has to be safe to rerun. 
again, instead of writing like a procedural script where you're going from the start to the end, very easy, you got to really think in terms of reaction. Like when an event happens, you do this. When this message comes in, you do this other thing. So it's a, a kind of different mindset, and we'll walk through some of those. Again, because your function is going to be short-lived, you cannot store and retain state. You can't expect that to be uh, retained. So if there is important state, because you're orchestrating a very complex workflow that requires multiple steps, you really need to store that state somewhere else. And somewhere else is probably somewhere else in the cloud. And finally, you got to think asynchronous, right? So again, with the classic procedural script, it's probably single-threaded. You could be using thread jobs or password jobs, but really, it's much more simple because you're thinking about, I'm starting from A, I'm going to get to Z or Z. Um, in this case, you can have multiple functions running at the same time, and we'll go through a complex example later on to show what this looks like. But the reality is, it is complicated. All right, and for, for new people, it might be a little bit scary. So then why choose it at all? Again, some of the aspects I covered earlier, but the key thing is it's actually pretty easy to get started. So you don't need a, the, the idea here is don't take a very complex app that you have today and try to bring it to the cloud as a service application. Start with some new scenarios um, and figure out you know, what, what makes sense to run in the service model. Again, we covered the inexpensive part. I'm going to have some data later on to show the cost that uh, my team is incurring to running the bot that I built. And really, uh, serverless means you don't worry about the server at all. You don't worry about updates. You don't worry about patching. You don't worry about the latest thing. And you really just focus on your application. So if you're able to do all this, then you're really going to be able to move forward much more quickly. Now, as a, as a room full of classic you know, PowerShell scripters, you know, how do you do that transition from thinking about uh, procedural scripts into a serverless developer? Uh, a couple of tips or things that I've thought about as I did my own journey. Um, again, the key thing here that I'm going to show today is that you can leverage your existing PowerShell script experience. You don't need to learn C Sharp. You don't need to learn Python and other things. Uh, again, start with simple scenarios, right? So try to look at new scenarios that make sense. Don't try to take your existing application that already works and move it to serverless. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, just start with some simple stuff, and we're going to step right into the next part, which is going to be a demo here. And I'm going to do all this from scratch. So I'm hoping there's nothing happening with Azure today. All right, so let me start from the Azure portal. And I do have this um, shortcut you can use if you can see that. But basically, it's uh, AKMS PS Funk. And uh, basically, it just takes you to the, uh, the wizard here to create a new function app. So let's make one called PSConf bot. That's not taken. All right. I need to change my subscription to, yeah, I have a lot of subscriptions. This is a test one. All right, so we're using Windows. We're going to do the consumption plan. Again, there's different plans here. Like the app service plan is more like a server model where you have a dedicated app service. Um, you still don't need to worry about updating it, but you're going to be paying for it versus the consumption plan is really the cheap one. I'll put it that way. Um, you want to change the runtime stack to PowerShell. Um, it's under public preview right now. Leave everything else, uh, and we're just going to hit Create. So this is going to take a little bit of time. So I'm going to switch to uh, the console. Hope you can all see that. And I already have the Funk CLI installed. Or actually, it should have been dash question mark. But So this is a tool that comes from uh, the Azure Functions team. We are currently working with them. So hopefully, maybe by GA, they'll have a complete PowerShell experience where they have commandlets, but they don't have that today. But we're going to use um, their CLI to do the next part of this. So I have nothing in this folder. First step is just to initialize a new function app. So just to be clarify, function app is a container that contains functions. All right, that's really all it is. So I'm going to choose PowerShell. This is going to write uh, the profile. This is, the profile is necessary if you want to do like Azure um, commandlets or if you want to do like MSI type of stuff for authentication. We're not going to cover that today. I think Joey has a separate session where he covers that. Let me just do a quick check on the portal. Okay, so it's already still deploying. All right, so now that we have our function app, we need to create a function. So we can do func new. And in this case, for the bot that we're going to write, it's going to be HTTP trigger, so that's number five. I'm going to call it uh, psconf bot. And let's look at the code real quick. All right, so this is all created for you. I'm going to make this bigger, get rid of the terminal. Yes. That's... All right, so this is just a template that gets created for the HTTP trigger. 
Um, I'm not going to walk through this because I would rather spend time walking through some of the new code I'm going to write. But basically, let me just go here real quick. I have some pre can code here. All right, so I'm going to get rid of um, this. And let me just format this real quick. Let me just deploy this, um, and then I'm going to explain what the code does because it takes a little bit of time to deploy. Azure function app publish. And I have to now remember what I call this thing. It's still underway. Taking a little bit longer than usual. All right, so while this is happening, I'm going to just go through the code here. Um, basically, this should all just look like regular PowerShell. It's a regular function. Um, by default, it's going to be called run PS1. You can rename it yourself to whatever you want, but that's the default. So what happens is, when my function gets instantiated, I'm going to receive this request object. And here, uh, what, you're, what you always want to be able to do is return a HTTP response. And this is going to contain two things. The status code, which I'm going to set to OK, and then the message body. In this case, the message body is going to be an object. Um, and the uh, PowerShell Azure uh, language workers, I'm not going to convert that to JSON. But here, um, I happen to know that the Teams API requires the JSON object to look like this, where it has a type member and a text member. And all this is going to do is, after I show later how I bind this to Teams, when I send a request to this function, I just want to post back what did this function actually receive from Teams. All right, does that make sense? And then we're going to go through that JSON to see how we can actually leverage it. And to make sure I can actually have this as text, because this will be a PS custom object, I'm going to convert it back to JSON. Let me just check on the deployment. All right, so this is complete. Uh, right here, poshconf bot. So let's publish this, poshconf bot. So what happened is that in the portal, I created an instance of the function app, and then I created the code for the function app locally on the system. And what I need to do is now publish this to Azure, right? So what this is going to do now is it's going to zip up all the contents of this bot, uh, very simple. PowerShell script right now. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. And then it's going to publish it into an Azure blob that is associated with that function uh, in Azure. And then when it's complete, I'll get back the HTTP trigger that I can use to call it. And you'll see some other compilation stuff that's happening because the actual uh, function host as well as the language worker is written in uh, C Sharp and .NET Core. So there is some compilation that happens. You don't need to worry about it as a PowerShell developer. But basically, if there are extensions needed to talk to like Azure storage queues and whatnot, I'll handle all that for you. So this is almost done. All right, a few more seconds. Because what I need is the trigger. All right, ah, oh, hold on, didn't succeed. What you should see here is actually the HTTP URL that is the trigger for this bot. So there is some issue right now. Uh, first, I'm not set up for doing it locally. <laughs> this morning, it was all fine. All right, so while I was going through that, uh, let me just go through the Teams part of what you would have to do on the Teams side and just get ready for that. So I have my uh, personal um, Teams team here. I call it Demo. And really, all you got to do is manage Team. Go to apps, and you want to create an outgoing webhook. So what this means is that uh, from the Teams chat, I can now associate a webhook, which is just the HTTP URL, and say when I send commands to um, whatever this name of the bot is, it's going to call into that uh, web URL. So let's call this uh, PS bot. So I still need that URL. So it's almost there. There we go. All right, this is better because now I should see the URL come out right here. All right. So let me copy that. Um, while I'm pasting, I'll explain why it looks kind of weird. So there's a whole bunch of uh, additional characters at the end. So this is more of a, like a security precaution. So if you look at the front part of this, uh, it could be pretty easy for someone to guess this part of the URL. So what this code is is a way to say, hey, you, you don't share that with the world, but basically, if when Teams calls into my bot, 
this is how Azure Functions kind of authenticates that this is actually a client that's able to call this, all right? And I'll give a simple description here of my bot. And let's create that. This is additional thing from Teams that I'm not going to leverage today. Basically, on the other side, uh, when you can also use this as a way to authenticate that this particular Teams client is actually the one calling into your function. So this will show up in the header as a token. So now that that's all set up, let's go into this channel, bot demo, and I can start talking to my bot. Let's come up. Uh, I have multiple bots here. Uh, hold on. This is where... Yeah, I want to get rid of the other one. This is what happens when we play with your own demos. Uh, which one did I... I think I, I just called it my bot, right? So it should be that one. All right, let's see if it works. Otherwise, I'll just reassociate it. Not a big deal. I can say hello. Of course, it's not, there's no commands. It's not processing any commands. But what it should return in a few seconds here is really the JSON payload that it, it received. Ah. All right, let me just make, make sure one more time. Otherwise, we're going to show a live debugging here. Okay, so let's figure out what do we do when it doesn't work. Let's go back to the portal. I actually have some suspicions. Text. Body. Okay, so let's go. I'm going to show you what you do if something's not working. So that's that bot. I'm going to go to that. Let's go to psconf bot. What? All of these. There we go. All right, so in here I can go to the functions. All right, so let's go into this. Uh, again, a function app can have multiple functions. What I really want to care about is the bottom here, logs. So there is this log streaming service. And I think I can, I don't know if I can get rid of the left side, but um, basically what this will show is the live traces that should happen when I try to call back into this bot again. And we can see hopefully what is happening. So, oh, did it work? Oh, I, okay, so there's this, oh yeah, it did work. So I'll just mention the other, the reason it probably didn't work is that there is this cold start issue on functions where uh, the way you think about it is the first time you start your function, it's going to take a little bit longer. I know that Microsoft Teams has a five second timeout where if you don't respond in five seconds, it will uh, basically go away. Um, so I think that's probably what happened the first couple of times. But you can kind of see here, and I'm just going to cut and paste this payload and I'll put it into code so you can see it better. I'm going to use my mouse. That's the reason I brought it. All right. So let's copy that. We'll go back into that. All right. Let's open a new. Oops. All right, so here's uh, the content. Let me just format it here. Oh, what is it? I know it's plain. Oh, is it plain text? There we go. All right, so you can see there, there's a ton of information that Teams actually sends you. Uh, and for, for this demo, we're not going to actually care about most of it. But for example, here it tells you who it's from. So if you want to do your own uh, authorization to see whether or not this particular person is allowed to talk to this bot, you can check against um, this name. And you just have to trust that Teams itself does the authentication correctly so no one else can pretend it's me in this case. Um, what I actually care about here is actually the text. So you can kind of see this is what got received. This is actually not completely true, and I'll show you in the um, updated code, but the key thing here is really this hello part. Like, I want to be able to pull that out so I can process, like, different commands that I might send to my bot. So let me go here. All right, 
So let's update our bot. Don't need that. Let me just reformat this. All right, so what's going to happen here is I happen to know, because I already played with this, that the body of this content here that you saw in the JSON file, it's over here, is actually going to be in uh, URL or HTML encoded. So I have to decode it. What that means is that certain characters, like the ampersand, will show up as you know amp uh, semicolon. So I want to make sure it's just regular text for when I'm processing it. Um, I have some additional tracing here, which I can show later. Um, you kind of saw when I did the log stream, these kind of traces will automatically show up. So it is actually perfectly fine to use write host. Write host actually is implemented on top of write information these days anyways. Uh, and basically, I'm going to use some regular expression to match it. And I happen to know that, in this case, when you saw um, this where it talks to psconfbot, it actually shows up in these uh, XML tags at. Um, so I'm just going to compare that. I don't really care about that. And... Without going into a ton of detail of regular expression, I think uh, Matthias had a session that covers a lot of things about regular expressions. The idea here is really I want to use a name match for command. That way it makes it easier for me to get it later. And I'm really just looking for anything that is uh, after the white space up through the new line. Because you can kind of see here, um, basically, I just care about this uh, content up to the new line. So that's all this is going to retrieve. And if it does match this, then I just want to get the command. I'm going to write it out in case anything bad happens. And what I'm going to do, and this is not a good example of what you should do, but I'm going to use invoke expression to just show as a demo that I can execute arbitrary PowerShell uh, against my bot and have it respond. And um, just for closure here, um, these backticks is because uh, teams will render content as markdown. So to make it more um, easily to understand and what it, to make it render correctly, I actually have to have all these backticks. So these escape the backticks. And in markdown, three backticks is a uh, fence code section. Um, let's see. Uh, we can have a whole other section about Markdown, or we can take it offline. Uh, let's see, the other things here, there's nothing else um, that's really new from the other example. Let me just save that, and let me republish it. Let me just go, uh, while that's waiting, let me just see if there's anything else worth mentioning here. Um, let me see, yeah. So I, when we go into the more complex bot that I, that I built, I'll show you how you can actually process multiple commands, um, how to handle error cases, in this case, um, I'm always sending back an OK because I want to let the client, which is uh, Microsoft Teams in this case, know that their request was received and I received it correctly. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything ha was handled correctly because Teams, you can kind of already saw, it's like when you re if you give it an error, it'll just say that you something wrong with your request. I mean, this is basically the up here the message that you'll get. So it's actually not very useful. All right, so this is almost done. And again, one thing you'll notice here is that uh, however many times I republish my function here for the same function, the, the web trigger URL will not change. So you can rely on that being the same. Now, if you have different functions within your function app and they're all HTTP triggers, each one will have a distinct URL. All right, so this is always a good sign when you see this. So this didn't change. So if we go back to the bot, I can say something like one plus one. And if I cross my fingers and it works, then... Ah, oh, I have an idea what this is. Sometimes cut and paste doesn't work correctly. Any weird characters here? All right, we go back to debugging. So let's clear that. Let's expand that. Let's reconnect. All right, let's try it again, and we'll hopefully see something that tells us why this is not. It's cough. Right. Maybe one plus two. First of all, let me make sure it fails. Oh, see, it worked this time. Uh, this is not a great example of Azure Functions, maybe, but hey, it worked. All right. <laughs> all right, so let's do something a little more interesting. So let's do get process. Because now, now that it's up and running, it won't necessarily go away for the 15-minute duration. So, oh, come on. I swear this is all working previously. All right, so this succeeded. So basically, um, see the interesting thing here is Functions actually runs in a custom sandbox in Windows. So you can see there's literally only two processes running in this sandbox. 
And this is relying on the uh, .NET host to host the PowerShell language worker, which is now hosting my script. Um, and the W3P, uh, W3WP is the uh, app service instance. So you know this, this particular sandbox doesn't really have much, but this kind of shows how you can do interaction. Um, again, ignoring some of the failures, uh, there wasn't a ton of work here to actually make this work, right? So I created a function app, I created a function, uh, I, it was an HTTP trigger, I got that URL, I associated it with my Teams account, and now I can talk to it, and I can have it do stuff. So let's go back here. Okay. So let's talk about something a little bit more complex, because obviously that was a little bit more than a hello world, but it's probably not uh, enough to actually be productive with. So again, we kind of talked a little bit about um, authorization, and I'll kind of go over how I did that in my bot. Um, you probably want to handle configuration, uh, especially like in the case of uh, PostChain bot. I have different repos that use it, and they have different requirements. Um, and we don't want some things to work in some repos, or maybe they're not set up for it. Uh, I also handle you know multiple step operations. So in the example you saw, I'm really just receiving some text. I'm uh, calling invoke expression and something happens. But if you're actually calling into other cloud services, it may require you getting something there and then sending it somewhere else. And of course, uh, there's also concurrency. So I'm going to show an example where if you have to handle um, multiple different types of requests and handle them differently, I'll show how that works. And of course, how to integrate it with um, Azure DevOps. So before I continue, just any questions so far? I'll make sure people aren't like lost. Yes? The function to configure my bot. So, oh, uh, so I'm not quite sure of your question, but oh, the fun, oh, where does the func CLI come from? Is that the question? Okay, so the question is, where did I install func CLI from? So, if you actually just do a search for func CLI, you'll get it. They have a GitHub page. It's an open source project, and if you're on Mac OS, for example, you can actually install it via Brew. I believe on Windows, you have to install it through NPM right now, and we're working with them to change it to a .NET global tool. Or Chocolate also has it, yeah. So there's a lot of different ways. If you, go to, if you just search for Funk CLI, um, you'll go to their page, and they have installed instructions for all this stuff. But again, uh, we are working with that team so that they have a complete PowerShell command line experience instead of just having a, a different command line tool. All right, so let's start talking about maybe how do we get into a little bit more complex scenario. So if you start out, you may think, all right, I'm going to have my uh, client. It could be Teams. It could be Slack. It could be whatever your favorite chat thing is. You know, and the benefit here is you can have mobile clients, desktop clients, web clients. And initially, you may think, all right, I'm going to have that call into my webhook, and I'm going to have that function call into some other REST API. And the problem here is if you start chaining all these REST calls, then the first, the one in purple, which is the one that you write, well, not return immediately because it itself is waiting on some other API, which may take time, and that may cause some other API, right? Um, so definitely, I think in the case of Teams, you have a five-second timeout. So uh, the likelihood of you completing all these operations, especially if you're doing, like, stopping a VM in Azure, that takes much more than five seconds, you're not going to return in time to let the client know that it actually received your request and succeeded. So the way to handle that is really to leverage storage queues, or it could be message queues, and spawn off individual tasks. So the idea here is the, the first purple box, REST API bot, is really just an orchestrator. It's going to receive the initial request, and it's going to then queue up the actual work that happens. And then those other purple boxes are additional functions now in Azure that actually does the work. So that's exactly what um, the PoshChan bot that I wrote does. Um, this is an open source project. This is um, my personal project, so it's not a PowerShell team project. You can go to it. You can use it. Um, it's all open source. You can open issues against me um, because it's a personal project. I don't treat it as a high priority compared to other stuff. Um, but like the, the key thing that I wanted for PostChamp Bot is really how to make uh, the team more productive on GitHub. So part of it is really having it. So it is very closely uh, today married to GitHub and Azure DevOps. So the thing is, it is triggered off of conversations on GitHub. So if you're familiar with uh, GitHub, like if in a pull request or an issue, if you provide a comment, that's a conversation. And also in GitHub, when you submit a pull request, when CI finishes or fails, it generates an event. And I have my bot triggered off that event. Uh, and again, as I mentioned today, it's 
really married closely to uh, Azure DevOps pipelines. But if anyone wants to use it and use it with like AppVate or Charts CI, I'm more than happy to uh, you know merge in a PR for that. So the current capabilities is really uh, around what some of the requests my team had. So for example, in Azure DevOps pipelines, sometimes a test uh, may fail because there's a network issue at that time, and we just want to retry it, or we may maybe we know it's some other transient problem and we want to rebuild it. So the difference between rebuild and retry in Azure DevOps pipelines is a rebuild will rerun the entire pipeline, and a retry will just retry the parts that failed within that pipeline. So you definitely want to try a retry first before, before you do a rebuild. Uh, one of the things that annoyed me personally is that uh, you know if my PR failed in the cloud, like I'll run something locally, I run the test locally, it passes, but then the environment in uh, Azure DevOps pipelines is different, so the tests fail, then I have to click through multiple links through GitHub all the way into Azure DevOps to find out what the test failures are. So one of the capabilities of this particular bot is that it'll trigger off of the CI uh, completing, and it actually goes into Azure DevOps and pulls those test failures and posts it back to uh, the GitHub pull requests, and then it notifies me that uh, not only has it completed, but what the failures are. And one of the uh, asks from the maintainers of the repos, you know, they want a simple capability where they look at a pull request, they've reviewed it, it all looks perfectly fine, it's just waiting for CI to finish, then you just say, hey, can I just get a simple reminder? So you can ask this bot to say, hey, remind me in one hour or five minutes or something like that. Um, and I'll show a quick demo of that in a bit. And I talked about costs. So this is a real chart uh, from a 30-day period. I believe it's from, you can't, it's kind of hard to read, but it's from April, the mid-April to mid-May. And you kind of see, um, if you look on the upper left, it costs a dollar and 48 cents to run this bot on the PowerShell repo. And I don't have other numbers, but it's, I think we get roughly maybe like 90 pull requests um, within a 30-day period. And also, one thing to keep in mind is that this bot is actually instantiated for any issue comment that comes out of GitHub. Um, because the GitHub webhook doesn't have the granular, granularity that I need to say, only call me when it mentions my bot. So it's gonna, so the, the bot will be called for everything, and I'll show in the code later on how I handle those situations. But if you look on the lower left here, uh, the key thing here is really like almost 95%, 99% of the cost is really on log analytics and storage. So if I decide for some bad reason that I don't need logging, um, I could get rid of that and you know, a bulk of my costs go away. Uh, the actual functions uh, CPU time is costing me two cents in 30 days. So again, if you have a high load, your costs will be much higher, but um, in this example, is it's really cheap to run this, and it really increases the team's productivity. So let's go through some quick demos to kind of, uh, for those who have not seen this or don't contribute to the repo, you may not have seen this. Some examples, of actually, what the bot does. So these are two uh, actual pull requests. I believe these are both from me, so I'm not calling anyone else out here. Uh, but you can kind of see here, um, I made a pull request, and it happened that there were some tests that failed, and it the bot itself picked it up, and the reason there's multiple messages, it's um, one for each operating system. I think one optimization I may do in the future is actually just combine all that into one message. Um, but the idea here is it can now tell me, in this case, it was a regression that some other pull requests had made, and I tried to make a fix, and it wasn't complete because I didn't update the test along with it. So um, this kind of shows some of the benefit here. Uh, here's another example where, again, this is my <laughs> pull request trying to fix a different problem, which is uh, another regression from Windows PowerShell in this case. Uh, and there were 13 failures, but in this case, I made sure that I didn't want to post this huge message into the uh, pull request. So I kind of just summarized it. Usually that's sufficient to give a sense of, you know, what, what should you look at, and you can start looking at it locally, whether or not it repros. Um, but one thing I can show live would be, you know, again, it's going to be something like this where I just mention it. So I can say, please remind me in one minute. And if we go up here, then uh, in a few seconds, you should get a, I should get an acknowledgement um, that it received my request. And GitHub sometimes doesn't auto refresh correctly. So if this doesn't show up soon, I'm just going to refresh this page. All right, so let me refresh it. Oh, is it going to be one of those days? Uh, hmm. I'll have to look later why this is not responding. I haven't made any changes. Oh, 
All right, I'll, I'll maybe I'll look at this later if we have time. We can try again a live debugging of this. Let's come back here. All right, so let me kind of just step through um, what actually happens with Posh and Bot. This is on the client side, so this is on the GitHub side. So basically on GitHub, I just basically register this as a webhook. And um, in GitHub, when you register a webhook, you can select what type of events you want to receive. So I'm really handling issue comments. So a pull request is actually an issue. We can actually have a commit associated with it. And I also want to handle status events. So status event is whenever CI runs, and if it fails, succeeds, starts, you'll get an event. And if either of those two things happen, it calls into my HTTP URL, and that calls into Azure Functions. So the more interesting part is actually what happens on the uh, serverless side. So let's kind of step through this. So let's say somebody sends a request. Let's say it's me, and I say, hey, please retry Linux, right? And it mentions my bot. So what happens is that GitHub is going to call the trigger, and the trigger is going to instantiate my function. So I run PS1 script in Azure Functions. And you know, in my code, I like to have all these helper modules so that I can kind of simplify um, the actual scripts. So in this case, I have a Postron module. And really, all this module is for is reading configuration. So again, because we actually use this particular bot in different repos across uh, the PowerShell team, that means that each repo might have different settings, because we may want to uh, authorize different users. Um, maybe the Azure DevOps org and project names are different. They probably will be. They're probably different from what we have on GitHub, so we can't assume that those are the same. So I have a bunch of configuration that I'll get through later. Um, so the key thing is really the authorization piece and the capabilities. So now, with that information, the bot checks to make sure, hey, is this someone who's authorized to actually call and do stuff? In this case, let's assume yes. So then the next thing I could do is, all right, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit, and I'll explain it. I want to now queue up the next function to do work. Um, so in this particular case, I have a helper that actually calls into another commandlet module that I wrote to, to work with Azure Queue Storage. And in general, for most of you who want to do this, you actually don't need to worry about um, commandlets calling into key storage. You would just call the push output binding, which I'll show later when we get into the code. Um, I had to do this specifically because if you remember the reminder capability that I had, the way that works is it's leveraging a capability in Azure Storage Queue where I can set a visibility timeout. So basically, I can post a message to the queue and say, don't show this like when I try to request a one minute reminder. Don't show it for one minute, right? So it's actually in the queue, but it's invisible. When it becomes visible, then that will trigger the next set of actions. Um, that visibility timeout capability is not exposed in um, Azure Functions today. So the only way I can leverage it is to call the REST API directly. And unfortunately today, um, Azure Storage um, doesn't have commandlets for the data plane. So they have a lot of commandlets for managing your storage, like creating storage, deleting storage. But they don't have any um, commandlets today for posting messages. So that's something, again, we're working with those teams. And with auto REST, hopefully that will come soon. So once I post it, then you kind of saw on the left side, like it disappeared because all that actually goes away. Like that script is done. Functions is going to clean up that run space, and it literally just goes away, right? So it posts back an OK to GitHub. GitHub says, all right, everything looks good. And then now that queue message after that timeout, if I have it set, is actually going to trigger a separate Azure function called Re um, AZ DevOps Rebuild is what I called it. Uh, and this will actually do the work with, uh, in this case, Azure DevOps, because I'm requesting a retry of the Linux build. And I have a separate module. Again, today, Azure DevOps doesn't have commandlets for the uh, data plane. Um, so I created a module that basically calls the Azure DevOps REST APIs, and that will then do the right thing to retry the build. And of course, I want to let um, the user know like this is all happening. So if all that succeeds so far, or, whether, or if it fails, I want to post back to the GitHub um, issue or pull request to say what happened. So I have a separate function here that does all that work. So all this function has to do, or any of the functions that I have written, if they want to post to GitHub, it's just going to post a message into the GitHub respond queue. So it's basically going to say who it needs to be sent to, what the message is. And then once that's done, that goes away, right? So now again, Azure Functions is going to clean up that run space because it's complete. And now this new function gets instantiated and takes care of this one operation. So the idea here is each function should take care of one little thing. You don't want to have a very complex function. Um, you can kind of imagine this as a pipeline. Um, not really, but sort of. And uh, on the GitHub side, again, I'm just calling some GitHub REST APIs, so I just wrap that as a module. 
and that takes care of that. And this is like the complete picture to kind of show everything. So it seems a little bit complicated, um, but once you do it like you know 20 times, it's pretty easy. Question? Yes. That's a good question. So the question is, if at any point, if one of the functions fails before it actually posts a message in the queue, what happens? So what will happen is, in, in the case that I've written it, um, I, I won't know until someone tells me that the things didn't happen, and then I will have to go through a debugging exercise to look in the logs. Eventually, what I want to do is actually have a watchdog function to monitor this whole thing to make sure that the right things are happening. So that hasn't been done yet. It's on my to-do list. Um, but you'll have to do something similar, right? Because if, let's say the uh, Azure DevOps rebuild function, like some, there's a, some unhandled exception and it blows up and it didn't actually get to the next step, um, it will be logged, but there's no action that gets taken at this point in time because it's, it's something that you would have to build. So let's see, all right. So I want to kind of get through most, most of the rest of the time going through the code here. Where's, oh, where's my mouse? Hold on. All right. I'll just sit here. All right, this is probably fine. Let's start with. Um, so I want to kind of show some of the JSONs first, because uh, one thing that you have to kind of be comfortable with is JSON and calling REST APIs. So let's see. So in this case, I already have one open. So this is what a JSON payload looks like if I'm calling to Azure DevOps API to get the failures. So in this case, um, there's three. I kind of redacted some information because this was not my PR. There's someone else who contributes to PowerShell. Um, but you can kind of see there's, uh, the key thing is there's going to be a lot more information than what you actually need. So you will have to spend time either looking through the documentation or looking through the actual JSON object to determine what parts of it you need for whatever it is you're trying to uh, accomplish. In my case, um, what I really needed from this uh, payload is really to send back to the user uh, the failures. And lower in here, you actually have the failure information, like here, right? So if you're familiar with Pester, this looks like a regular Pester type of error. And I just kind of grabbed this out of this JSON. And again, in your code, you don't have to worry about JSON because the partial language worker will automatically convert it to a partial object for you. Um, but you still need to kind of understand the, what, what it looks like, and it's much easier to look at it in JSON format. So let me just start with the main function here. Make this bigger so I can see. Let me just, everything's so big. All right, hold on. Let me just close all these. All right, so this is the function app. We got a bunch of modules. So here's the first file. So when it first comes in again, it's very similar to the Teams sample that you saw. Um, I have a lot more write host here because that really helps on troubleshooting when I have problems. Um, but you're going to get this object. I have some helper function because I happen to be pushing to the uh, GitHub queue quite often in here for a lot of different cases. So rather than having the same type of code all, all over the place, I just handle it here. Um, one of the things I also handle is reactions. So reactions is like the thumbs up. So the idea here, and it was a suggestion, I don't recall it's from the community or from the team, where instead of posting a message to GitHub and say, I received your request, it just, uh, the bot will just post a thumbs up to your request, and that's the way you know that it actually received it. All right, so getting into more of the meat here. Let's see. So. So I have this um, get settings. So this is in the helper module that I talked about. Uh, we can look at that real quick. So under modules, here. So all this is going to do is, given a particular GitHub organization and project, I'm going to look into, uh, it's going to look into their default branch, which is most people master. But it's going to look in this folder and it's going to look for settings.json file. So I think it's probably easiest to look at what we've done in the GitHub repo. Just for an example. So here. So the settings JSON. 
And it's always good to version your stuff uh, because things change quite a bit. Um, what you can see here is I have a separate section for all the Azure DevOps um, capabilities. In this case, uh, because different repos might call their things differently, then I don't want to have someone type out this. This is the actual name that's in Azure DevOps, but who wants to type that out, right? So this is kind of like an aliasing capability. And if you use all, then it's going to pass in this array. And you can kind of see um, these are all the users. These are all people on my team. Uh, and also the community maintainer, Ilya. Um, they're all authorized to request rebuilds and retries from Azure DevOps. Um, one of the key things here is uh, this is kind of uh, kind of like a run as kind of thing because uh, I'll, maybe I'll show it in the code later. But basically, the way it works in Azure DevOps is it's actually associated with my personal assets token. So when Ilya here, um, who doesn't have actually the permission on Azure DevOps to do this himself, calls my bot, my bot is actually using my credentials to actually uh, initiate the rebuild and retry. So you just have to make sure all that like, stuff gets logged. Anything bad happens. Uh, for failures, which is you can actually request failures, but it can also auto post. Um, these are all the users. So because this is a more of a benign operation, it's not requesting a rebuild. There's a lot more people from the community that's been um, authorized to do this. And then the reminders, very simple. So I say, hey, just let everyone ask a reminder if they want. Yeah, question. Uh, the question is, I can differ from the output. Who can get the feedback? So I can really, this is really the uh, authorizing the input. So the input meaning what, uh, this is where the terms get a little bit confusing. So what, when GitHub sends me a request, then the request that I receive, which in my mind is going to be the input, um, I can look in that, and we'll look at some of that JSON and say, hey, if they are in this list, they can do these type of things, right? So again, this is a design that I created. So it's not necessarily something that um, you get for free. It's something you would have to do yourself. But you can follow this model, right? Um, the idea here is like if your bot has multiple capabilities and some are more impactful. Uh, for example, if you want to do uh, VM management through your bot and you say starting a VM is pretty safe, you can allow more people. Stopping VM is very destructive. Only a small SIP can do it. You can still use this kind of model. And because this is all just a JSON file checked into GitHub, then everyone sees when someone tries to make a modification, you review it, you go through the normal pull request to uh, handle that. All right, so let's go back to the code here. Um, one other thing I'll mention is you can kind of see here, like for all the um, personal access tokens that I need, and I really need the two, which is one for GitHub, because I need the personal access token for the bot, which has its own uh, account on GitHub that I created. Um, that way it posts under the bot, not under me. Um, I also have the access token to talk into um, Azure DevOps. You should never have any of that stuff in your script itself. All right? So the way you do that is in your function app here. Okay, so I'll look in the function itself. Uh, the best practice here is really to set them as environmental variables. So if I go into this uh, function app, you go into the app settings. Oh, no, not here. Things are a little bit slow. It's quicker for me to just cook. So you're going to have, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Everything looks different because it's so zoomed in. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so here's all your um, settings. These basically become environmental variables for your script. So you can create any number of them that you want. Um, these are all hidden by default. And this way, uh, people can contribute to your script, but they won't know your secrets. Let's go back here. Okay. So yeah, so this was getting the the settings, and basically, this is a JSON um, format, and I'm just going to return that. Just go jump 
back to this guy. All right. So after we get the settings, then the next thing I really want to do is on the GitHub side, um, I happen to know that this GitHub event is um, in the request headers. Um, it'll tell me what type of event it is. And basically, I have a switch statement that tells me if it's an issue comment, then do this processing. Or if it's a status event, which is much lower down here, then do this other thing. Now, in the case that it's an issue comment, then I want to, because again, uh, GitHub doesn't give me the granularity when I register for an event to say, only send me stuff that at mentions my bot. It's going to send me everything, right? So if someone replies to any issue on GitHub in the PowerShell repo, this bot will be triggered. Um, so the way I check is that I, I make sure that the, the message here for the name of who it's being sent to uh, is mentioning this particular bot, right? So it's going to mention uh, at PostChan. So if it doesn't, I'm just going to throw it away and I'm going to exit this, this uh, function is complete. And you kind of see, even though there's a lot of that activity, it still only costs me about two cents in activations per month. So it's very cheap. Once I have that, then I want to start looking at the body. Um, well, the other thing I want to check is that the message is created because I don't want to have the bot react to a, a message that's been edited or deleted. So the next thing is make sure it's created. And then down here, um, because I want people to be polite, uh, if they don't say please, then I send a helpful message to say you m all everything starts with please. Um, and if you want this other settings, I have this funny GIF from uh, Jurassic Park <laughs> that some people obviously didn't watch. Uh, but basically, it's the uh, same. You must say please. All right, so once it passes all those checks, then the next thing I want to see is, all right, what is the command it's trying to request, right? Because I, I don't need to authorize anything yet because there's different type of operations. Uh, in this case, if they're requesting failures, then I'm going to have this other uh, helper uh, to do test user, right? So going back to test user now, which is in this file down here, then this is how I do authorization. So the idea is um, in the JSON payload, it'll tell me who is actually making the request. And I have to trust GitHub to do the authentication to validate that that is the real user. And I have to do authorization in my script to make sure like, that user is authorized to do this operation. So I have this helper function that does that check for me. And I also special case, if it's the asterisk, then everyone has access to it. Can I just go back? Can that work? Yes. All right, so let's assume all that passed. So they said, please, they're authorized to do the, the Git failures. Then the next thing is really doing the GitHub work. So in this case, I need to get the uh, GitHub pull requests because I, like, when I get called from uh, GitHub, as part of that payload, and I can kind of show it in a bit if it's interest, um, one of the members of that JSON is the actual pull request associated with this issue comment. Um, I need that so that I can then, in this case, um, I'm getting test failures. From that payload, I can traverse uh, and get into the statuses, which is, again, all the CI operations. And from there, I have to do some regular expression matching because there's no, uh, I have to get basically the build ID that exists in Azure DevOps that's associated with this pull request. And there's no member that just tells me this is matched to that. So I had to figure out, and if they ever change this, then I'll have to change this to match with it. Um, but basically, there's a URL in uh, the payload that this um, target URL is going to map from the GitHub pull request status into a Azure DevOps build. But really, I need to get this build ID. So again, I'm using a regular expression here to pull up that build ID. And once all that succeeds, then I'm not going to get the failures yet, but I want to tell the user that, all right, everything here is so far correct, and I'm going to send a reaction. So I'm going to send a plus one, a thumbs up to that uh, user to let them know I've received the request, and the rest of it should follow. And here, uh, I didn't necessarily follow my own best practice, because this is actually not that slow. Uh, this is actually going to get the failure message. Um, really, I should probably queue this up and have this running as a separate function, but I got a little bit lazy. All right, um, so let me quickly move through some, anything else that's interesting here. So this is the rebuild. Uh, let me just skip all this, because it's all kind of very similar. Let me get to the status, which is a little bit different. Let's see. Skipping all this is the reminder. And so a status is different from an issue comment. So this is a different type of event that happens from GitHub. In this case, 
I'll receive statuses for any CI operation, right? So here, I'll receive it for when, when CI starts, when CI um, is running, and also when CI fails. And I really only care when CI fails. I don't want to do anything with the other states. So the first check is, because again, I want to kind of optimize how long my function runs, and I don't want to pay for processing stuff that is not interesting. So in this case, there's a failure, and there's a lot of code that's very similar. You see above me, I should kind of uh, refactor some of this, but I also need to get the build ID, and I get the I have a helper function to get the failure messages. And then here is where uh, I need to post it back to the, the GitHub so that it informs the user. And you kind of saw earlier I had this uh, helper to push GitHub comment, which is up here. And all this is is using the helper that I wrote to push something onto this uh, storage queue. Now, in most cases, again, you should not have to do this unless you also want to leverage the uh, visibility timer capability. But instead, you should be using let's see if I can find it, push output binding. So here, um, again, the way to think about it is this um, main function is receiving a request. It's going to queue off other tasks, but it still has to respond back to the client, which is GitHub, that things were received correctly. So I'm using just a simple um, commandlet that comes with the language worker to push out uh, HTTP response that says OK. Right? There's no, there's no uh, need to send out a body here. And I think we are now entering Q&A soon. Let's see. All right, so in summary, uh, I know there's been maybe a lot of information that was given right now, but the key thing is, you can build serverless applications using PowerShell, right? You can leverage your existing skills today. Yes, um, there's a bunch of stuff that you have to learn. You have to think a little bit differently. Um, but it's all possible. Just start with simple scenarios first. Um, I believe that if you leverage bots and chat ops, you can be more productive. And again, it's not necessarily suitable for all situations. Or for some situations, it can actually be tremendously helpful. I automate a lot of stuff. You can make it interactive. Um, and you will have to learn JSON HTTP. But with PowerShell Core, with the improvements that we've made, um, a lot of changes were from like Mark Krauss on the HTTP side. It actually makes it a lot easier than it um, would have been without PowerShell. Slides and demo, Q&A. All right, questions? Yes? OK, so the question is, is this compatible with other cognitive services offerings? So the answer is yes. So this is where earlier I talked about bot frameworks, right? So one of the benefits of bot frameworks, it has a um, automatic inclusion in a lot of cognitive services. So if you want to do like natural language processing, so instead of doing regular expression, you could match maybe different languages or how people express things. So if you wanted to do it with this model that I presented, is that you can still call into a, uh, one of the Azure Cognitive Services REST APIs, passing in the text and getting back a uh, object that represents what the payload looks like. Um, I haven't done it myself, because for my scenarios, um, I kind of have it hard-coded. It's just it was simpler. Um, in the future, I may do that as an exercise. But I know that the last time I looked at some of the natural language processing, there's some training involved. Um, especially like in the case um, where I need to support both rebuild and retry, right? Those are two distinct things for Azure DevOps. From a natural language processing, it may not automatically know that those are two distinct things, right? So I have to train it to know when someone says uh, rerun something, does that mean retry? Does it mean rebuild? Or other variations of that, right? So there's some work that has to be involved, but it's certainly possible to um, integrate it with cognitive services. Any other questions? Yes. Good question. So I think there's, uh, let me end this. I can show you real quick before time runs out. Oh, sorry. So the question is, how does this work with modules? Um, there's two parts to that. One is, uh, where do the modules come from? How do you store it? And the second one is, if you have a long-running module, what happens? A long-running module is no different from a long-running script. If you hit your timeout, which is anywhere between like 5 to 15 minutes, your function will just be, it'll be blown away. It'll be, it'll be gone, right? Um, in terms of the modules themselves, so if you just have a folder called modules in your function app, then when you do the publish, uh, as part of that func CLI, it's going to package the modules folder and push it up, all this up with it. So you don't have to do anything special, right? And then when you run, when functions runs your scripts, it automatically, the language worker automatically adds this location in Azure to your PS module path. 
So you don't have to worry about that either. Right? So I don't have to worry about import module or anything like that. It's all automatically discovered. Um, in some cases I have PSD1, in some cases I don't. Uh, you should always have PSD1. Um, but yeah, so all that is handled for you. And if you're using Azure uh, PowerShell, then there's a different capability in Azure Functions that I think Joey will cover, which is the managed dependencies. So you don't have to worry about updating those versions. In this case, all of these modules are custom that I wrote for my bot, so I up those, update these myself. But if you want to use like some other module off the PowerShell gallery, you just to save module to this folder. All right, I think uh, one more question. <laughs> Great question. So how do you test this? So one of the things I don't have, and I, not because I don't have and I can't show it, is really testing. Um, the way I've been thinking about how I want to test this is I'll probably leverage mocks a lot. Um, so I'll probably do, what I will probably do is two things, because I want to be able to run the test locally, um, so I can test it before I send it up, and I also want to run it in the cloud. So the way I do it today is I actually have a copy of my bot that I call PoshBand Bot Staging, and whenever I make changes, I test it with the staging bot in my um, PoshChan bot repo before I deploy it to like the PowerShell repo, right? because I don't want to mess them up. Um, so that's how I validate before I actually roll it into production. So pre-production, I have a staging bot, but I don't actually have good tests right now. But I'm thinking the way to do it is probably do a bunch of mocks, because I don't want to say have real queues, and I can't have real GitHub there. I have to mock GitHub and stuff like that. Oh, for sure. Yes. So the statement is, yeah, the statement is uh, for all my custom modules, for unit testing, I can absolutely test all those locally. Like, I don't need uh, GitHub. I can mock all that. So definitely, uh, yes, I have a lack of tests here. Not good practice. All right. I think we're out of time. So if there's any more questions, I'll be, I'm still available. Or if you have questions about anything else, just follow up and you know, ask me. I'm more than happy to talk about that. Thank you.